Imagine looking up at the sky and seeing a gigantic shadow, a being that defies all logic, with wings as large as a small airplane. No, it's not a dragon or a fantasy creature. It's real. Millions of years ago, long before humans even existed, the skies of our planet were dominated by creatures so extraordinary that they seemed straight out of a fantasy movie. They were the pterosaurs, the undisputed masters of the air. But among them was one that stood out, a true titan of the skies, the Quetzalcoatlus, the largest flying animal that ever existed. It was so large that if you were on the ground watching it take flight, you would feel the same impression as seeing a helicopter take off right in front of you. But how was it possible for something so immense to fly? What did it eat? Where did it live? Today, we are going to explore all these questions. From the deserts of Texas, where its fossils were discovered, to the scientific debates that still divide experts about its behavior. Was it a lowland hunter, a fisherman, or a scavenger that used its enormous size to intimidate other predators? The story of Quetzalcoatlus begins in 1971 in the vast plains of Big Bend, Texas. It was here that young paleontologist Douglas Lawson made a discovery that would forever change our understanding of prehistoric flying giants. Lawson was searching for fossils of flying reptiles, but what he found exceeded any expectations, fragmentary remains of a colossal creature. Among the fossils excavated were parts of an enormous wing, a humerus bone, and fragments of the skull. From these fragments, scientists were able to estimate its size, and the result was astonishing. Quetzalcoatlus had a wingspan that reached between 10 and 12 meters, similar to that of a small airplane. Its height, when standing on solid ground, easily exceeded that of a giraffe, reaching about 5 meters. As for its weight, estimates vary, but it is thought to have weighed between 200 and 250 kilograms, thanks to its hollow bones that significantly reduced its mass. The size of the bones was so extraordinary that Lawson initially doubted what he was seeing. How could something so large have flown? It was a puzzle that left the scientific community stunned. Based on these remains, in 1975, Lawson named this creature Quetzalcoatlus Northropi, in honor of the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, a mythological figure that symbolized the sky and the wind. At that time, Big Ben was not the arid desert we know today. 68 million years ago, this region was a fertile plain filled with rivers and swamps, an ideal place for a creature like Quetzalcoatlus to live and hunt. But how did such an incredible fossil become preserved? The humid environment of the time helped preserve the remains in sediments that later turned into rock. However, the discovery of Quetzalcoatlus was not without controversy. From the beginning, paleontologists debated its real size and flight capability. Even today, not everyone agrees on whether it truly reached a wingspan of 12 meters or how it managed to take off from the ground. The Quetzalcoatlus was not only impressive because of its size, but also due to its unique anatomy, designed to dominate the skies. Its wings, made of a membrane of skin and muscle, supported by an elongated fourth finger, were incredibly lightweight, yet strong. This structure, combined with hollow and thin bones, gave it the ability to fly long distances with remarkable energy efficiency. Its skull, elongated and toothless, was another of its most distinctive features. Some models suggest it could exceed 2.5 meters in length, ideal for capturing small prey or searching for food on solid ground. The absence of teeth, combined with a sharp beak, indicates that its diet probably depended on what it could easily catch, though we will discuss this in more detail shortly. On land, Quetzalcoatlus moved quadrupedally, using its folded wings for support on the ground. This not only made it more stable, but also allowed it to move with agility despite its size. This mode of locomotion is evident thanks to studies of fossilized footprints from other pterosaurs. The bones of Quetzalcoatlus were hollow and extremely lightweight, yet strong enough to withstand the stresses of flight. These bones were internally reinforced by a system of trabeculae, similar to the scaffolding of a building, which gave them strength without adding unnecessary weight. This combination of lightness and strength was key for an animal of its size to not only fly, but also remain agile on land. Its forelimbs were extremely robust, a key adaptation for takeoff. It is believed that it used a leap propelled by its hind legs and a powerful thrust from its forewings, similar to a catapult jump. 
This technique provided the necessary force for takeoff, even from flat terrain. Its skin and wing membranes could have been covered with structures similar to hair, known as pycnofibers. These would have helped regulate its temperature and might have had patterns or colors, although this is speculative. Imagine this giant with shades that camouflaged it on the ground or made it intimidating in flight. One of the major debates surrounding Quetzalcoatlus revolves around its diet. While it's tempting to imagine it catching fish like a giant pelican, fossil evidence and its anatomy suggest that its feeding behavior might have been more complex. Its elongated, toothless skull, combined with a sharp beak, would have allowed it to capture a wide variety of prey. On land, it is likely that it was an opportunistic predator, hunting small animals like lizards, primitive mammals, and dinosaur hatchlings. Its wingspan and size would have given it an intimidating advantage over smaller predators, allowing it to dominate hunting areas with little competition. This hypothesis is supported by comparisons with modern birds like the marabou stork, which uses its size to assert dominance in its environment. However, it is also possible that Quetzalcoatlus supplemented its diet with carrion. Its large beak would have allowed it to tear meat from carcasses left behind by other predators. This would have placed it in an ecological role similar to that of modern vultures, especially in an ecosystem where resources could be limited. Quetzalcoatlus lived in a diverse environment dominated by dinosaurs such as tyrannosaurs and hadrosaurids. Despite the competition, it occupied a unique ecological niche as the largest flyer of its time. Its ability to alternate between flying and moving on land gave it an advantage over other predators. Whether hunting or scavenging, its size and strength would have likely intimidated smaller scavengers, such as dromaeosaurs. Furthermore, its ability to fly would have allowed it to quickly escape dangerous situations, like the arrival of a tyrannosaur. The Quetzalcoatlus was designed to cover great distances with minimal energy expenditure. Like modern albatrosses, it probably took advantage of air currents to glide for hours or even days without the need to flap its wings frequently. This would have allowed it to explore vast areas in search of food or better environmental conditions. Quetzalcoatlus was not an active flyer like hummingbirds, but it could flap its wings when necessary, though more slowly and less frequently due to its size. This ability gave it versatility in the air, allowing it to maneuver when conditions required or face unfavorable currents. Its flying abilities, however, were not just limited to efficiency. It was also fast for its size. Estimates suggest it could reach speeds of up to 80 kilometers per h in flight. In terms of altitude, it could take advantage of thermal currents to rise to heights of several hundred or even thousands of meters, giving it a privileged view of its surroundings. Some scientists propose that these creatures might have been migratory, traveling great seasonal distances to take advantage of resources in different regions. This migratory capability not only shows its incredible flying skill, but also its ecological flexibility, adapting to changes in its environment. As for its social life, while there is no direct evidence, it is possible that it formed colonies during certain times of the year, especially during the nesting period. Imagine dozens of these creatures gathering in an open area where the adults defended the young while others foraged for food. This dynamic would have been similar to that of many modern birds that gather in colonies to breed and raise their chicks. As we mentioned, it was discovered in the Big Bend region of Texas, which gives us an initial clue about its habitat. This area, 68, 66 million years ago, was a much more fertile and diverse environment than the desert we know today. It was composed of vast river plains, wet forests, and meandering rivers, an ideal setting for such a large and adaptable animal. However, fossil evidence indicates that its distribution was not limited to this region. Remains of closely related pterosaurs, such as Aramborgiania in Jordan, suggest that Ajdarkids, the family to which Quetzalcoatlus belonged, were widely distributed across North America, Europe, Asia, and even Africa. While not all of these fossils belong specifically to Quetzalcoatlus, they show that its closest relatives were true global colonizers. It is likely that Quetzalcoatlus inhabited much of the land that today corresponds to North America, especially in open areas rich in resources such as coastal plains and riverbanks. Its ability to fly long distances would have allowed it to explore vast areas in search of food or better climatic conditions, making it a tireless and adaptable traveler. Quetzalcoatlus has inspired fascinating theories about its life and behavior, 
but it has also generated a series of scientific debates. One of the most controversial topics is its size. Although it is considered the largest pterosaur ever discovered, some experts have questioned whether it really reached the proposed dimensions. The fossils found by Douglas Lawson mainly include fragments of the wing and skull, which forced paleontologists to reconstruct the rest of the animal based on models of other pterosaurs. While these methods are accurate, reconstructions are always subject to reinterpretation. This has led some researchers to argue that its wingspan may have been slightly smaller, while others claim that it is indeed possible that even larger specimens exist that have yet to be discovered. Another point of debate is the comparison with other giant pterosaurs like Hatsagopteryx, discovered in Eastern Europe. This colossus, found in Romania, is probably Quetzalcoatlus's closest rival in terms of size and fame. This giant pterosaur, also belonging to the Ajdarkids, lived during the late Cretaceous. Its wingspan is estimated to be around 10 to 12 meters, very similar to that of Quetzalcoatlus. However, Hatsagopteryx exhibited very different anatomical features, which has led to debates about its lifestyle and abilities. Unlike Quetzalcoatlus, which had a long, slender neck designed for efficient flight, Hatsagopteryx had a much more robust skull and neck. Its skull, over three meters in length, was thick and solid, suggesting it was designed for hunting or crushing larger prey. Some paleontologists believe Hatsagopteryx may have had a more terrestrial behavior, using its strength on land to hunt small dinosaurs on the open plains of the island of Hatek, an ancient island environment. If you want to know more about this island and Hatsagopteryx, considered the largest known aerial predator, I recommend watching our video on the scariest island on the planet. In terms of flight, its robustness posed certain limitations compared to the more aerodynamic design of Quetzalcoatlus. However, its size and strength would have been sufficient to take off and glide over moderate distances, although it probably didn't cover the vast ranges that Quetzalcoatlus could. Another great colossus that roamed the skies of our planet is Aramborgiania philadelphiae, known from fossil fragments found in Jordan. It is another contender in the category of giant pterosaurs. Although the fossils are less complete than those of Quetzalcoatlus or Hatsagopteryx, estimates of its wingspan range from 10 to 11 meters, placing it in the same league of aerial titans. The most notable fossil of Aramborgiania is an extremely elongated cervical vertebra, measuring over 60 centimeters in length. This suggests that, like Quetzalcoatlus, this pterosaur had a very long neck, which would have allowed it to explore different ecological niches possibly using its neck to reach prey from a stationary position. However, the lack of more fossil remains limits our understanding of its biomechanics and flying capabilities. Aramborgiania probably lived in coastal or semi-arid regions, suggesting a lifestyle similar to other Ajdarkids, opportunistic hunter or even scavenger. Although its size makes it a formidable pterosaur, its fame has been overshadowed by the larger amount of data available on Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsagopteryx. Quetzalco Atlas represents the closest we have to a real dragon. Although it didn't breathe fire or have scales, its imposing figure, majestic flight, and ability to cover vast distances make it an icon that could easily fit into legends. It serves as a reminder that although these creatures no longer walk among us, their legacy endures in science and our imagination. Since its discovery, Quetzalcoatlus has been the focus of paleontological attention and the protagonist of debates that continue to this day. Its importance lies in having completely changed our perception of the limits of animal flight and the role that giant flyers played in late Cretaceous ecosystems. Before its discovery in Texas, the idea that an animal with a wingspan of up to 12 meters could fly seemed closer to mythology than reality. However, this pterosaur showed that the skies of the past were dominated by true titans.